Good, good. Can you hear me? Yeah, he good. He good. How how's everything over there? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Um, we had a game yesterday. Unfortunately, we we lost. But um, yeah, it's been a it's been a good preseason for us, and just excited for for games to start now, and with fans at last as well. So they're already able to go in and watch the game. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're able to um to have full crowds now, which is which is yeah. Cool, it's been... cool. So sorry, so, sorry for like the rush, man. Sorry for taking it. That's all good. It's all good. Yeah, thanks. So first of all, can you like introduce yourself for the coaches in Taiwan? Yeah, sure. Like it. It's mad that I'm, I'm speaking to guys in in, in Taiwan from uh, from England. But yeah, I'm a um, athletic performance coach here in England in the in the UK. Uh, I currently work uh, in rugby union. Uh, work for the Bristol Bears, um, looking after some of their senior team, um, in charge of everything from yeah speed development, strength development, power conditioning, etc. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a very brief um, synopsis of me, I guess. Cool, man. That's nice. So first of all, I kind of want to talk about like speed development. Sure. So, like, if you if you're gonna train like rugby players, what's the difference between training track guys and like rugby players? Good question. I, I guess probably to quote Stu McMillan, you've got to learn learn the rules before you can you can break them. So. Like there are lots of similarities between track athletes and rugby players in terms of what you would deliver, uh, and rugby players don't tend to have much of a background in traditional speed uh, training. So a lot of the things that you would do with a a young athletics athlete would be applicable here, and there's some pretty low hanging fruit with in terms of uh, technique development that you could, that you can make with with rugby players. Obviously. Where it differs is where it comes into some more of the the multi-directional stuff, uh, and probably how much exposure to speed you give them. Because at the end of the day, the rugby is is the key thing. So as much as you want to develop their speed, um, they need to be able to perform the rugby skills and perform the skills at speed. So that that's probably where some of the progressions start to go towards. Is okay once you've built some general capacity of speed, is how can you then translate that? To on pitch performance and being able to to catch pass, um, to be able to set up defenders, beat defenders, and, and things like that uh, with the the speed that you've got. Um, so that there are lots of similarities. Like if you were to watch some of our more general speed development sessions, they would look quite similar to uh, like track based sessions. Um, but yeah, it's when that next stage is where it probably differs and forks out from uh, a traditional track athlete to someone who's uh who's a rugby player cool man so basically you train like the same way chat guys train right pretty much yeah like obviously the the volumes m might might differ uh and we, we look to try and get our guys uh, a regular exposure to max velocity uh at least once a week whereas i'm guessing the guys in track would want to be Looking to get a lot more regular exposures to max velocity than, than we do. A lot of our our standards are maybe a little lower there, um, but with the the beating that they take um, week in week out in games, you have to lower your expectations a little bit um, as to what what you can do. But just having a regular exposure to max velocity can be quite a, a pretty uh, strong stimulus for them to adapt to, um, because they're so beginner almost in their in their level of level of training and when it comes to speed that can sometimes be enough to actually develop let alone maintain some of the qualities that you want um, so yeah we we integrate with our sports scientists to to get feedback there to to work out whether they've achieved uh, max velocity or not um, we, we use bands ideally above 90 percent even better above 95 and then we, we found like in season we're regularly hitting uh, pbs maybe once or twice uh, one, one or two players a week, probably in season, um, which I'd love to say is is all to do with our training, but it's probably to do with the, uh, how little opportunity they get actually to open up to access their top end speed. So um, I, I, yeah, like I think that shows in itself that if, 
if you're getting two or three speed PBs a week when it comes to max velocity, that's that's not your training program. That's more just they are so unexposed to it that there's some low hanging fruit there that's so easy to grab that just giving them a regular exposure can be like it sounds as simple as that, but like to get fast, you've got to run fast. So yeah. rather than spending half an hour doing a bunch of drills with them, warm them up, make sure that they're ready, and then get get them at least one opportunity to try and open up and, and run as fast as you can. Uh, and and that that goes a long way in terms of developing speed in rugby players. Yeah. So you mentioned like you mentioned a lot of a lot of times about like max velocity. So why is max velocity so important for like like team sport athletes? I th- usually people mention like more about like acceleration. So why max velocity so important? Well. Like you say, speed kills, um, and albeit acceleration is probably the one that they get m- the majority of their uh, exposure to. Whenever they are exposed to max velocity, it's usually in game-breaking moments that end up in points. So you either done something really, really well, or you're in deep trouble and you're having to run fast to make up for the tr- uh, the issues that you're in. Uh, so we we had a like a really, really good moment last season where. Uh, which kind of showed this pretty well, where quite often rugby, like you've got the backs who are kind of skill guys, if you're to use NFL terminology, who are, it makes sense that they need speed to, to beat people on the edge and score tries. But uh, your forwards tend to be your, your grunt men who do a lot more acceleration focus work and they'd be the equivalent of your, your linemen in, in American football. Um, but we had a moment where, one of our one of our players gave the ball away when we were almost about to score a try, uh, and then I think about six of our players, including three forwards, pretty much had a max V effort over around about sixty seventy meters um, to make a tackle two meters out from the line, um, and it wasn't if it was just one of them that had made the effort. Um, the other team would have just picked up the ball and scored because the guy making the tackle isn't going to be able to recover. Whereas because we had so many people as well join the defensive line, we were able to stop a try and actually get a turnover. And like that was a almost a fourteen point swing um, because then from there we then scored uh, scored off of it. Um, and it really really changed the momentum in the game. And it shows that even though for some of our front row forwards that might be the only exposure that they need that they get in a game for two, three weeks. If they are exposed to it, it's usually in a very, very important moment in the game. So we have to make sure that we give them that exposure. Um, but also from a from an injury prevention perspective, like you've got to be prepared so that like there's nothing worse than asking our athletes to make that 60 meter sprint when they've never done it before in training. So uh, from a hamstring injury perspective, like it's really important that we give them that that max velocity uh, exposure. I don't know some people call it like a, a speed vaccine, but it, it would be something along those lines. Cool. So can I tell like everyone about like how do you program speed like in season and off season wise? So we've just come off of our preseason. So um, we would normally have two sessions a week, about 40 minutes dedicated to speed, usually on a, on a Monday and Wednesday. We, in preseason, we trained sort of a, a high low model, so we had a, a high day on a Monday, a, a pretty low day on a Tuesday, uh, with meetings and, and some light gym. Then Wednesday we would go high again, uh, and both those Mondays and Wednesdays we would we would train speed as well as a, a pretty hefty rugby exposure. Uh, and then Thursday would be a, a recovery day um, where they might ice bath yoga, pool, um, and then Friday would be our final exposure, which is a lot more um, kind of conditioning focused. So our, our speed work uh, takes a back seat there. Um, but yeah, two, two 40 minute exposures in season there. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, in preseason. And then in season, we would look, our, our main speed day is, is on a Monday, um, where that session would be about 20, 25 minutes where they'll spend five minutes doing prep for acceleration, five minutes prep for max velocity, and then we'll end up running them through timing gates, usually once a week, um, 10 meters, 20 meters, and a 40 meter exposure. Um, Obviously, dependent on game and and soreness and and how they've recovered, they can opt out of that, um, but we'll we'll try and get them 
uh, to at least be involved, even if they're just dialing it down when it comes to the, the top end speed effort. So we'll regularly have guys who haven't fully recovered yet or have got little niggles or we're, they've got a couple of red flags that have been um, flagged up by the physios or from conversations we've had in the gym uh, prior uh, where we'll go, right, okay, just dial it down 80%. Like just get some speed through your legs, but it's nothing. You're not going to set the world alight. I, I don't want any kind of strain while you're running just to manage that risk, really. Um, so, yeah, like that would be what an in-season speed session would look like. And then later on in the week, usually on a Thursday, we'll have more of our change of direction, um, more specific, rugby-specific focused uh, speed session where they they might, uh, they, they might delve into a little bit of... Um, some high-end efforts but it'll be more relevant to uh change direction and it'll be with a ball and um yeah they probably don't realize that they're getting it but they're just trying to beat someone in space or, or however, however we've structured the drill really um in season cool so if it's in, in season the game is on like sunday or like saturday uh, mostly saturday but it, it does vary so it'll either be friday saturday or sunday so uh like for example uh, we played yesterday on a Saturday, but then our, our next turnaround is Friday. So that squeezes up our week a little bit. Um, so from there, we'll then change up how we program. We might not be as aggressive. Um, so it might be on that Monday morning. We're just a little bit more worried. So we'll give them less volume or we'll change the week up, do it a little later. Um, if we have a longer turnaround, then we can be a bit more aggressive because the guys have got more chance to recover going into the session. And we've not got to worry about um, fatigue going into the game because we've got long enough time to, to do our sessions and then allow them time to recover and adapt. How about, how about like weight room? Like the, the ratio between training speed and going to like lifting heavy, heavy, yeah. like heavy weight lifting. Yeah, so we'll probably have three weight sessions a week, usually Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, Monday would be our max strength day so quite often that would be where we pick up our, our heavy lower body um, and then Tuesday would usually be more upper body focused and injury prevention and, and wrist site loading so that would be where we pick up at the end of the day our, our hamstring loading, our calf loading and things like that uh, and then Thursday traditionally would be more of our power focused day uh, where some of our gym work might be lent a little bit more towards speed development so we might start that session with 15 minutes of, of horizontal force development um, perhaps um, dependent on need uh, and then we might jump into the gym and do some of our vertical force development so that might be jump squats trap bar jumps olympic lift variants etc uh, plyometrics uh, and then we'll finish that session off with, with a little bit of upper body um, but our, our main dose of, of heavy strength training especially for the lower body at least comes on that monday um, Again, the ideal order, I guess you could argue that you'd maybe do your speed first, but there's a lot of things that we, we need to get through. And so they'll lift pretty heavy uh, early in the morning uh, and then they'll have a fairly decent amount of time to recover before they warm up and then do their speed session leading into leading into a clarity, low-key rugby session. So, um, yeah, like for us, we haven't really run into too many issues where guys have like lifted really heavy and, and are, are cooked going into that speed session. So like it, it's been working so far. So we keep rolling with it because it allows us more opportunity to do other things later, later down the line in the week. Cool. Cool. So we talk about like speed and speed development. How about like deceleration? Yeah. So I'd say our deceleration is, is probably picked up a lot more in the rugby. Um, we do with rehabbers look at doing specific deceleration focused training, um, but we would we would tend to use deceleration as a theme potentially in those Thursday sessions that are a little bit more specific to the game. Um, so that would be our our prep to perform sessions where we would try uh, and work on some rugby based skills that like that could be, for example, uh, ball carrying or defensive positioning or like different different skills that we uh, we're looking to develop and uh, that would be where we would try and do a little bit of our deceleration training but we probably spend a lot less of our time on that 
um, because they pick up a fairly large amount of that already in, in the rugby itself. Um, so we'll just touch upon the basics of that um, very briefly in, in the warm up to that session. So it, it'll be five minutes of exposure potentially, just trying to get them to to learn how to kill momentum, to to level change, and to work on that breaking strength, to be able to have the capacity to decelerate in sport specific actions. Um, we have we haven't really done too much of it yet, but we're looking into using uh, the uh, 1080. So we, we're lucky enough to have a 1080 sprint um, to do some overspeed into into some deceleration to to overload that a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, we'll just try and use those drills that uh, develop the rugby actions to kind of pressurize that deceleration. So that might be some constraints around drill size or, or start positions, um, things like the time, different rules, th things like that to, to overload deceleration. So, so a good example of that would be, for example, in, in a ball carry drill, you might start the defender in a disadvantaged position so that they have to fly off the line to even stand a chance to, to make the tackle, um, which puts them in, a, in, a, in an exposed position to be stepped back inside where they have to decelerate hard. So if the attacker decides to cut back inside, the defender then has to be able to control their feet and bleed off the speed pretty effectively and pretty quickly um, to stand a chance at, at winning the drill. Um, so we'll, we'll give them exposure to things like that in a, in a defensive or attacking sense um, like, but that would be a lot more in the background rather than something that's coached in a in a closed setting. Um, it's mainly just with with rehab athletes that we would probably spend a, a decent amount of training time uh, looking at like level changing um, and and the basics of foot positioning and, and things like that. We'll, we'll touch upon it with cues, but like it won't be the main focus. The main focus will be um, yeah more on the rugby side of things and, and deception and, and yeah can they perceive what the defender's doing or the defender, can they read the cues off of the attacker and things like that, really. Cool. I, I'm going to jump back into, like, the speed speed thing. So <laughs> do you, like, do you guys, like, teach their, like, or coach their mechanic, like, speed, yeah. like, acceleration and, like, max velocity? And how do you, like, teach them and, like, it's if I think it's in preseason, right? So yeah, we'll, we'll 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 do we'll do both. Um, so like in preseason, the way we structure it because we have two sessions a week, we'll have one that's focused more on acceleration, one that's more focused on max velocity, and then in season we'll touch upon both. We might theme it like and periodize it so that for a few weeks we're working more towards acceleration. Uh, other sessions will be more of a hybrid where we work on both. And it'll just really depend on where the session's going with the themes really um so if, if we're working on say for example on more like defensive stuff where it's more acceleration deceleration that might be where we spend a little bit more of our of our coaching time with with drills we, we utilize video feedback a fair bit um so what, when we do uh when we do our, our runs through the gates weekly all of that's filmed with a with a, a decent camera so we can get decent slow-mo footage and uh, we'll clip that up. Um, and then if we spot things with, with athletes, either generally, then we might feed that back. We're lucky enough to have a big screen that we can we can do presentations and just at the start of a session, just two minutes, throw up a few clips, a few screen grabs um, from yeah using on form or huddle technique or whatever the app is that you want to use, Darkfish, things like that, um, to get really into the specifics of it. But at the same time, like quite often, we try and pick off individuals and send little clips uh, to them. So it might be, for example, uh, an athlete struggling um, with attacking back in acceleration um, and they're, they're casting out. Uh, so it might be that we see in, in the drills that we've done that are filmed that they're struggling with that and they aren't really understanding that position. That might then get sent to them. Look, this is what you're doing. This is what I want. This is how we can get it better. This is the intervention we're going to do with you. Right, we're going to do some heavy run rocket or sled accelerations where I need you to preserve your shin angle and, and really focus on attacking back to the ground. That might be what we do. Um, and then it's just an individual thing picked up with them. Um, but yeah, we will do a fair amount of, of technical coaching. Um, but equally, like I said, we won't spend all of our time on that. We do need to still give them that exposure to maximal intent accelerations 
uh, top end speed where they're actually going at decent decent velocities like there's nothing worse than spending half an hour doing loads of wicket drills and uh, and high knee high knee drills and all the different a drills and then that's your speed session where they've gone no faster than 60 percent of their max velocity but like, that's not going to end up developing speed like that might be a good learning session and might be a good session to do as a kind of recovery like lighter day but like, if that's your development days then you're probably getting speed quite wrong in, in my eyes at least so it sounds like you microdose like speed right and you microdose the speed technique in like all year long right that was like pretty cool man that was like pretty cool yeah, so it, we'll, we'll obviously change it. So, like, uh, as the as the season went on last season, because we were like the games were coming in thick and fast, and it, it wasn't really because we we're coming off of the COVID period. Like, the guys have been playing basically two years of rugby straight. We had to find ways to maybe dial it down every now and again. So we did speed where we were going offline. Um, so it's not just straight linear speed. So it was max velocity off of arcs and curves. Um, which is probably a little bit more sport specific. Um, we also um, focused some stuff on uh, separation of, of upper body from lower body, which which is quite important in in rugby. Where like if you took a track athlete and you told them to run in a straight line, they smoke any of our rugby players that we could put in uh, that we could offer. But if we asked that track athlete to be able to run in a straight line, catch a ball out here, rotate their upper body, and then rip rip a pass with their upper body uh, rotated while keeping their lower body square, I imagine our, our rugby athlete would be able to perform that better. And so we, we work on a little bit more of um, that sport specific speed because quite often a, a situation that, that occurs in, in rugby is you might have a guy who might be capable of running 10 metres per second on the edge, but if the guy passing him the ball falls off the pass and closes that guy's space, the defender has much more opportunity to make that tackle. Whereas if I can get my guy who's making the pass to square up the defender and fix him and then rip a pass, that guy who can run 10 metres per second on the outside suddenly has 10 metres of space rather than four or five. And so straight away, he's, he's, he stands a much better chance to, to finish that try. So um, that would be some of the work that happens maybe a little bit more down the line in season. Um, but yeah, very much in pre-season at the start of the year, it's back to basics, back to... Um, straight linear mechanics, um, working on uh, yeah, good postures, good positions, um, and, and things like that. And yeah, that that would be where we spend most of our time, uh, training time. Cool, man. So I'm gonna jump into the next topic about like multi-directional speed and multi-directional movement. So mm -hmm. how like so how do you coach multi-directional movement and multi-directional speed? So. Well, I'm, I'm very lucky with some of the coaches that I work with, the rugby coaches, and that the drills that they run actually in the rugby sessions in, in units and things like that are done with really good intent and they're well thought out. They get a fairly large amount of multi-directional uh, like training in th those sessions. And so I would play like a peripheral bit part role in um, assisting them, making sure that those sessions are right and that the, that it's integrated with some of the more physical uh, development or general things that I want to get from it. Um, we do touch upon some of the multi-directional bits, uh, especially in pre-season. As I said, when we go back to basics, like teaching guys um, how to level change, how to um, kill momentum and what they're doing with their limbs. So is, is there, should their limb be outside their base of support or inside? Where, where, where's the pressure through their feet? Things like that. Um, but yeah, pretty quickly we try and spend most of our training time when they're with us dealing with quite sport specific things. So very rarely is it quite closed. Um, it will be very quickly against the defender where we're trying to coach uh, deception. What, what were your thought processes here? Like what was the decision making here? What, where are your eyes? What cues are you picking up? Um, as well as some of the, the more basic things uh, the, a, a change of direction drill would, would focus on. Um, so yeah, we, we've the way we structure our, our sessions um, kind of follows the model of, of prep, perform, and then play. Uh, and that prep stuff would look like your very closed 
um, change of direction training, but we spend very little time there and we try and spend as much time as we can on, on the play section as it were, which starts to look a little bit more like the rugby itself. Um, and, and the key thing for us is that, that there's, there's maximal training intent. And, and quite often I, 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 I've seen myself in my own sessions um, and from other sessions I've seen from other coaches is that as soon as it's with the rugby coach, the intention, the intent goes up, the intensity of the session starts to ramp up because at the end of the day, it's them who pick the team, not the S&C coach. Um, so quite often some of the S&C SNC led sessions that I've ran have, have lacked this. And as much as I can maybe coach some of the specifics of, of body angles and things like that, it, there's no, no uh, substitute for uh, maximal intent and doing it at true live game speeds. So um, yeah, we'll try and get as, as much as we can integrated with, with the coaches um, and yeah, we'll sometimes play a bit, a bit part role in that. Um, but equally, uh, what we, what, where we feel we can add some value in giving them something that they don't already get is taking a bit of the pressure off uh, on them, like working on things that maybe they don't get a chance to work on. So uh, a good example, like one of the things that, that a lot of the coaches, um, the S&C coaches will say in these sessions is that let's, this is your opportunity to explore and do something you don't do at Ashton Gate, which is our home stadium. Um, so like the, if you've ever seen someone like Pat Mahomes training, like some of the ridiculous arm angles that, that he has and the things that he's doing, like he's just sort of playing in the backyard that you feel like, how on earth has he spotted this? And how, how is he getting his body in this position? Why is he even thought to make, choose that option there? And yet it works for him. If you look at some of the training that he's doing, he's practicing no look passes in training. He's in the gym with a towel practicing weird arm angles. So we'll try and do that with some of our players where we'll go, right. Okay. Uh, the pressure's off here a little bit because I'm not too worried if you don't get any outcome success, this is actually a chance for you to learn and practice some of the things that you, you don't always even think about doing. So some of the more crazy stuff with uh, steps and cuts and, um, different kicks and regathers and passes and stuff that maybe a little bit more uh, flair and things that, that maybe the traditional coach would be like, no, 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 that, that's not, that's, you need to do the basics here. Like actually we try and right, this is your chance to explore, experiment and almost sharpen some of the weapons that like, for example, we might have one player who's got a phenomenal right foot step and that's his weapon that he uses in game all the time. And it's very effective for him. But actually, if we can work on his left foot step or different kinds of deceptions leading into it, speed changes to lull the defender uh, that he maybe doesn't always use in the game because he's always using that one tool. If I can sharpen up the other tools in his toolbox, then when he comes to, to the real live bullets of a game, all of a sudden he might spot that situation. And now he's going to use that left foot step that he wouldn't have even thought of using because he's done it 10, 15 times in training with, with me in a session that maybe he wouldn't get exposure to in training because he's afraid of making a mistake. Um, so we try and utilize a lot of those sessions for things like that uh, on, yeah, like sharpening the tools in your toolbox that don't always uh, get much use and trying to give them like, whereas you're saying like micro dose, we'd actually like macro dose here and try and give them large exposures to a certain situation. So it might be, for example, like a, a winger um, might get say, three opportunities to finish in the corner to score a try in a training week. We might work that in a, in a drill where they're getting 15 exposures. So they're getting almost a month's worth of exposure to this very specific skill in one session. Um, so it is, it's really good for, from our perspective when we've worked on these things with the players in the week and then they feel the confidence that they actually go and, um, yeah, go and do it actually on the field in, in the game situation and, and feel the confidence that they're able to execute it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably where we spend most of our time from a multi-directional perspective. Um, Does that, yeah. So it sounds like you like, uh, you focus on more like a specific movement, right? Yeah. Instead of like people always say like general stuff, general stuff specific move but like coaches always talk talk about like you should train more general in general in season instead of specific but what it just says like 
opposite. Yeah, so I would say, um, like, I, I can kind of see where you're coming from there, but I would say that's maybe more linked towards uh, the gym. Like, very often coaches can get quite, can go too far down the rabbit hole with trying to make the gym look like the field. Um, whereas I would say that's where you want to spend most of your time doing very general stuff. Like if, if you're, like you need to be adaptation led. So like what are you actually trying to achieve in the session? So if it's a gym session, you're probably looking to overload some physiology, phys, physiological yeah, yeah. quality. Yeah. Um, so that would be where you need to be more general. When you get to say some of the multi-directional stuff, actually what are you trying to develop there? Is it a physical quality? Well, if it is, I, I would suggest that probably you could overload that better in the, in, in the gym in a more general sense. So actually that's where you're trying to overload um, skill, you're trying to overload decision-making, timing and things like that, that start to become like to get the, the adaptations you want, you're going to need a quite specific stimulus. Um, so that's where like, people can fall down the track of being quite general for maybe a bit too much and then, then you run into the field where, all right, I can do this drill while I'm doing a ladder drill where I can step my foot outside my center of mass fantastically, but I haven't been ch uh, challenged uh, perceptually. So I, I don't know how to read the cues. I don't know the timing of when I need to cut because I don't understand the spatial temporal things of how fast is this guy coming towards me? What are my capabilities and affordances for how quickly I can step? I don't know how to freeze that defender to get him to sit, to get me more time to take the space because I've spent all my time doing ladder drills or stepping to a cone and going left, going right. Like even, even things that are still not that specific, like a cone and a color, like, okay, that, that's a step in the right direction. But at the same time, like no one, no one in, in rugby or in, in team sports is running there with a cone, yellow or yellow or red. So actually, we probably need to be even more specific to the, the cues we pick up. So like, what are the things that the top end performers are looking at for making decisions? So is it where the defender's eyes are? Is it their hip position? What about their feet position? Are they, are they in a staggered stance or are they sat? Are they in their heels or on their, on their toes? Like, what entry speed have they got? These are all the things that you can be like giving them exposure to. So why wouldn't you? Um, so from my eyes, I, I would spend a lot more of my time doing drills that look a lot more specific to to the game um but equally that's with a caveat that you've got to make sure that you're giving them something that they don't already get like if, if they're getting it already in their in their team sessions and you're just doing a diluted version of that then that's probably training time you could spend maybe spending more time in the gym or doing yeah. more general based stuff so that's where it comes holistically like a, a big picture thinking of like okay what adaptations am i looking for what's my training time how do i allot that training time am i just doing this drill because i saw it on instagram and it looked cool or am i actually I, am i actually answering the why of okay I, this is what i'm actually trying to achieve with these guys and, and then can i coach it effectively do the players that i'm coaching understand why they're doing this do they get the intention that i want from them um and then can i uh motivate them or constrain them to give maximum intent and, and that's the second piece there as well when you're structuring your drills you've got to make sure that you, you've got your constraints right so like with rugby players they're highly competitive so as soon as you can make it you can pair them off you add competition scoring systems but the intensity goes right up through the roof so all of a sudden when they're making cuts they're doing it at real world speeds rather than sort of just jogging through where like it, it's not really going to develop anything from a physiological perspective so I would say yeah, lots of things there that you can pick up to to improve your coaching. Like that, yeah, you, you've got you like you've got to have the athletes buy in so that they can give you maximum intent. Once you've got that, I think I think coaching it starts to become a lot lot easier when when you have that top down approach from uh, yeah. answering the why first. Man, I love the way you program all this. It's like it's so smart, so cool. Well, I, I have to say, it's not just me that I work with a lot of really good coaches and have had a lot of um, good mentors through the years. And, and we do consult with, with other experts within the field that have, um, yeah, I've just begged, borrowed and stolen uh, blatantly from. So, um, yeah, I can't take all that credit. <laughs> that's for sure. Last thing, last thing. So how about, like, eccentric training? Like, do you use, like, 
slow tempo or like fast eccentric? Yeah, so we do do some eccentric training. Um, again, depends on what we're trying to target. Like uh, we use our eccentric training a lot more in a, in a general sense to build physiology. Um, so like a lot of our eccentric training will be super maximal. Um, so like heavily overloaded AEL, manually overloaded um, to try and get neurological adaptations to build strength is probably our, our main kind of main go-to there to start with um but equally at the same time um we will uh do a little bit of eccentrically overloaded specific stuff so like i said we've been experimenting with the 1080 sprint to to overload deceleration um and that's something that we'll probably roll out starting with some of our rehabbers but then looking if, if it goes well with those guys we'll probably look to do it with some of our fit athletes um to try and improve their breaking strength uh, and every now and again, dependent on the phase and, and how we periodize it, we, we will do a little bit of uh, some uh, eccentrically overloaded jumps and things like that at fast velocities. But for the most part, it's it's AEL, manually overloaded, trying to improve strength. So things like um, eccentrically overloaded uh, bench press, eccentrically overloaded chins, um, our usual lower body eccentrics, so like things like Nordics, uh, RDLs, um, we will do some tempo work from time to time um, just to make sure we've got decent control. Um, and, and also with some of our younger athletes as a coaching tool, because uh, again, young athletes just want to put as much weight as they can on the bar and, and outlift each other. Whereas actually by constraining the tempo and saying, right, okay, you've got to control this for five seconds. All of a sudden the weight's got to come down for them to be able to do that. Um, but also they then start to hold the postures and shapes that we want during the lift. So they start to understand squat form a little bit better than just putting 200 kilos on their back and just getting collapsed and folded into the, into the hole and then somehow round backing it up. Like, uh, I, th I think tempo has a place there. Um, but again, being adaptation led, if we're trying to overload um, the neurological side of things, then, then tempo isn't really where we want to go because we want to overload um, that force velocity curve super maximally and eccentrics allows us to do that uh, so if you're going sub maximal to hold it for five seconds you're actually only lifting say 70 percent of your 1rm well straight away that that's not really super maximal you you're getting time under tension which is which is good um, but if if you're trying to overload from a strength perspective actually you're going to have to go super maximal so we'll um yeah, we've we've done a fair bit of, of manually overloaded stuff so that we can actually overload throughout the entire range, um, which, which is something that sometimes using weight releases and, and AEL doesn't always do that well. Um, but we will, will use a little bit of that uh, from time to time. Um, things like uh, overloaded squats where using a safety bar and handles so that they, um, they have to control un, under the heavy load with, say, 120% of their 1RM. Uh, and then they'll pull themselves up out of the hole. Um, and then we'll also use just real, real simple stuff like uh, up with two, down with one is a really easy way of, of implementing eccentric training without any fancy equipment. Um, but yeah, we, we've had some, some fairly decent um, uh, improvements from that so far since we implemented it in preseason. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll have other things as well, like, like shoulder injuries are quite a big deal in, in rugby. So we do some, some shoulder eccentric work that tends to be manually overloaded. So it'd be like some T's, Y's, W's, some external uh, rotations, eccentrics, things like that, um, just to yeah, get that rotator cuff strong so that when they are caught in a tackle out wide and out long, they're able to um, yeah, hopefully have the physical capacity to, to withhold that and, and not end up with any sort of catastrophic injuries. In, in, in an ideal world obviously sometimes you get caught out in the wrong position you're still going to get injured no matter what um, but yeah we, we try and do our best to to find where those risk sites are and, and try and yeah build up their their coat of armor there where, where we can thanks man the way you like explain all this uh, from the first from the first question about like speed development and deceleration and multi-directional stuff it's kind of like the way you program it. It's kind of like different from what what we used to know in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's gonna be very helpful for the coaches in Taiwan, man. 
appreciate it. So if no there's like, yeah. So if there is like coaches want to like contact you, where can they find you? Yeah, sure. Like uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to um, answer emails. I think my email is on the Bristol Bears website. Uh, probably the best place to grab me is is my Twitter. It's probably where I'm uh, the biggest sort of S and C Norse, uh, which I think is just at Pete Burridge. Uh, Instagram, I, I am active on Instagram, but it's mostly just pictures of me and my wife on holiday. So you won't see that much when it comes to uh, strength and conditioning. So Twitter is probably um, the best place for that. I am on Facebook as well. But again, Facebook is just pictures of uh, me in school for my old school friends to look at and my grandma to look at really. So um, you won't find much S&C stuff there. But yeah, tw Twitter is probably the best place. But you can reach out to me on, on, on any platform and, and I'll... I'll be able to get back to you and yeah happy to chat with anyone or answer emails and questions and yeah it's, it's still just crazy to think that people in taiwan are even listening to me speak to be honest and even wanting to tune into what i've got to say but um yeah it's yeah feel free to reach out anyone who's listening thanks man next time i'm gonna next time i'm gonna use twitter <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's sweet. it's sweet i really love the way you program things and the way you explain it. And I know you're like really busy, but probably like if there's like any like, I don't know, free time for you, probably you should do like a second episode. Yeah, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to um, go in a little bit more detail. Like Again, it, I've listened to many of these, these sorts of things and you hear great things, but then when you actually see it in action, it, it, it it leaves you a little bit more wanting. So yeah, I'm happy to go into a lot more depth in terms of the, the specifics of how I program and, and the week and the decision making that goes into that. Yeah, absolutely. Love it, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Eric. See you. See ya. So that's about all.